Chapter 14 of Short Stories. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Short Stories by Fyodor Dostoevsky. The Dream of a Ridiculous Man, Part 1. I am a ridiculous person. Now they call me a madman. That would be a promotion if it were not that I remain as ridiculous in their eyes as before. But now I do not resent it. They are all dear to me now, even when they laugh at me. And indeed it is just then that they are particularly dear to me. I could join in their laughter, not exactly at myself, but through affection for them, if I did not feel so sad as I look at them. Sad because they do not know the truth, and I do know it. Oh, how hard it is to be the only one who knows the truth. But they won't understand that. No, they won't understand it. In old days I used to be miserable at seeming ridiculous. Not seeming, but being. I have always been ridiculous, and I have known it. Perhaps from the hour I was born. Perhaps from the time I was seven years old I knew I was ridiculous. Afterwards I went to school, studied at the university, and do you know, the more I learned, the more thoroughly I understood that I was ridiculous, so that it seemed, in the end, as though all the sciences I studied at the university existed only to prove and make evident to me, as I went more deeply into them, that I was ridiculous. It was the same with life as it was with science. With every year, the same consciousness of the ridiculous figure I cut in every relation grew and strengthened. Everyone always laughed at me, but not one of them knew or guessed that if there were one man on earth who knew better than anybody else that I was absurd, it was myself. And what I resented most of all was that they did not know that. But that was my own fault. I was so proud that nothing would have ever induced me to tell it to anyone. This pride grew in me with the years. And if it had happened that I allowed myself to confess to anyone that I was ridiculous, I believe that I should have blown out my brains that same evening. Oh, how I suffered in my early youth from the fear that I might give way and confess it to my schoolfellows. But since I grew to manhood, I have for some unknown reason become calmer, though I realized my awful characteristic more fully every year. I say unknown. For to this day I cannot tell why it was. Perhaps it was owing to the terrible misery that was growing in my soul, through something which was of more consequence than anything else about me, that something was the conviction that had come upon me that nothing in the world mattered. I had long had an inkling of it, but the full realization came last year, almost suddenly. I suddenly felt that it was all the same to me whether the world existed, or whether there had never been anything at all. I began to feel with all my being that there was nothing existing. At first I fancied that many things had existed in the past, but afterwards I guessed that there never had been anything in the past either, but that it had only seemed so for some reason. Little by little I guessed that there would be nothing in the future either. Then I left off being angry with people, and almost ceased to notice them. Indeed, this showed itself even in the pettiest trifles. I used, for instance, to knock against people in the street, and not so much from being lost in thought. What had I to think about? I had almost given up thinking by that time. Nothing mattered to me, if at least I had solved my problems. Oh, I had not settled one of them, and how many there were. But I gave up caring about anything, and all the problems disappeared. And it was after that I found out the truth. I learnt the truth last November, on the 3rd of November to be precise, and I remember every instant since. It was a gloomy evening, one of the gloomiest possible evenings. I was going home at about eleven o'clock, and I remember that I thought that the evening could not be gloomier, even physically. Rain had been falling all day and it had been a cold, gloomy, almost menacing rain, with, I remember, an unmistakable spite against mankind. Suddenly, between ten and eleven, it had stopped, 
and was followed by a horrible dampness, colder and damper than the rain, and a sort of steam was rising from everything, from every stone in the street, and from every by-lane, if one looked down it as far as one could. A thought suddenly occurred to me, that if all the street lamps had been put out, it would have been less cheerless, that the gas made one's heart sadder, because it lighted it all up. I had had scarcely any dinner that day, and had been spending the evening with an engineer, and two other friends had been there also. I sat silent. I fancy I bored them. They talked of something rousing, and suddenly they got excited over it. But they did not really care, I could see that, and only made a show of being excited. I suddenly said as much to them. My friends, I said, you really do not care one way or the other. They were not offended, but they all laughed at me. That was because I spoke without any note of reproach, simply because it did not matter to me. They saw it did not, and it amused them. As I was thinking about the gas lamps in the street, I looked up at the sky. The sky was horribly dark, but one could distinctly see tattered clouds, and between them fathomless black patches. Suddenly I noticed in one of these patches a star, and began watching it intently. That was because that star gave me an idea. I decided to kill myself that night. I had firmly determined to do so two months before, and poor as I was, I bought a splendid revolver that very day, and loaded it. But two months had passed, and it was still lying in my drawer. I was so utterly indifferent that I wanted to seize a moment when I would not be so indifferent. Why? I don't know. And so for two months every night that I came home, I thought I would shoot myself. I kept waiting for the right moment. And so now this star gave me a thought. I made up my mind that it should certainly be that night. And why the star gave me the thought, I don't know. And just as I was looking at the sky, this little girl took me by the elbow. The street was empty, and there was scarcely anyone to be seen. A cabman was sleeping in the distance in his cab. It was a child of eight, with a kerchief on her head, wearing nothing but a wretched little dress, all soaked with rain. But I noticed particularly her wet, broken shoes. And I recall them now. They caught my eye particularly. She suddenly pulled me by the elbow and called me. She was not weeping, but was spasmodically crying out some words which she could not utter properly, because she was shivering and shuddering all over. She was in terror about something, and kept crying, Mammy, Mammy. I turned facing her. I did not say a word and went on, but she ran, pulling at me, and there was that note in her voice which in frightened children means despair. I know that sound. Though she did not articulate the words, I understood that her mother was dying, or that something of the sort was happening to them, and that she had run out to call someone, to find something to help her mother. I did not go with her. On the contrary, I had an impulse to drive her away. I told her first to go to a policeman. But clasping her hands, she ran beside me sobbing and gasping, and would not leave me. Then I stamped my foot and shouted at her. She called out, Sir, sir, but suddenly abandoned me, and rushed headlong across the road. Some other passerby appeared there, and she evidently flew from me to him. I mounted up to my fifth story. I have a room in a flat where there are other lodgers. My room is small and poor, with a garret window in the shape of a semicircle. I have a sofa covered with American leather, a table with books on it, Two chairs and a comfortable armchair, as old as old can be, but of the good old-fashioned shape. I sat down, lighted a candle, and began thinking. In the room next to mine, through the partition wall, a perfect bedlam was going on. It had been going on for the last three days. A retired captain lived there, and he had half-dozen visitors, gentlemen of doubtful reputation, drinking vodka and playing stoss with old cards. The night before there had been a fight and I know that two of them had been for a long time engaged in dragging each other about by the hair. The landlady wanted to complain, but she was in abject terror of the captain. There was only one other lodger in the flat, a thin little regimental lady, on a visit to Petersburg with three little children who had been taken ill, 
since they came into the lodgings. Both she and her children were in mortal fear of the captain, and lay trembling and crossing themselves all night, and the youngest child had a sort of fit from fright. That captain, I know for a fact, sometimes stops people in the Nevsky Prospect and begs. They won't take him into the service, but strange to say, that's why I'm telling this, all this month that the captain has been here, his behavior has caused me no annoyance. I have, of course, tried to avoid his acquaintance from the very beginning, and he, too, was bored with me from the first, but I never care how much they shout on the other side of the petition, nor how many of them there are in there. I sit up all night and forget them so completely that I do not even hear them. I stay awake till daybreak, and have been going on like that for the last year. I sit up all night in my armchair at the table doing nothing. I only read by day. I sit, don't even think. Ideas of a sort wander through my mind, and I let them come and go as they will. A whole candle is burnt every night. I sat down quietly at the table, took out the revolver, and put it down before me. When I had put it down, I asked myself, I remember. Is that so? And answered with complete conviction, It is. That is, I shall shoot myself. I knew that I should shoot myself that night for certain, but how much longer I should go on sitting at the table I did not know, and no doubt I should have shot myself if it had not been for that little girl. You see, though nothing mattered to me, I could feel pain. For instance, if anyone had struck me, it would have hurt me. It was the same morally. If anything very pathetic happened, I should have felt pity, just as I used to do in old days, when there were things in life that did matter to me. I had felt pity that evening. I should have certainly helped a child. Why, then, had I not helped the little girl? Because of an idea that occurred to me at the time, when she was calling and pulling at me, a question suddenly arose before me, and I could not settle it. The question was an idle one, but I was vexed. I was vexed at the reflection that if I were going to make an end of myself that night, nothing in life ought to have mattered to me. Why was it that all at once I did not feel that nothing mattered and was sorry for the little girl? I remember that I was very sorry for her, so much so that I felt a strange pang, quite incongruous in my position. Really, I do not know better how to convey my fleeting sensation at the moment, but the sensation persisted at home when I was sitting at the table, and I was very much irritated, as I had not been for a long time past. One reflection followed another. I saw clearly that so long as I was still a human being and not nothingness, I was alive and so could suffer, be angry, and feel shame at my actions. So be it. But if I am going to kill myself in two hours, say, what is the little girl to me, and what have I to do with shame, or with anything else in the world? I shall turn into nothing, absolutely nothing, and can it really be true that the consciousness that I shall completely cease to exist immediately, and so everything else will cease to exist, does not in the least affect my feeling of pity for the child, nor the feeling of shame after a contemptible action? I stamped and shouted at the unhappy child, as though to say, not only I feel no pity, but even if I behave inhumanly and contemptibly, I am free to, for in another two hours, everything will be extinguished. Do you believe that that was why I shouted that? I am almost convinced of it now. It seemed clear to me that life and the world somehow depended upon me now. I may almost say that the world now seemed created for me alone. If I shot myself, the world would cease to be, at least for me. I say nothing of its being likely that nothing will exist for anyone when I am gone, and that as soon as my consciousness is extinguished, the whole world will vanish too, and become void like a phantom, as a mere appurtenance of my consciousness. For possibly all this world and all these people are only me, myself. I remember that as I sat and reflected, I turned all these new questions that swarmed one after another quite the other way, and thought of something quite new. For instance, a strange reflection suddenly occurred to me, 
that if I had lived before on the moon or on Mars, and there had committed the most disgraceful and dishonorable action, and had there been put to such shame and ignominy as one can only conceive and realize in dreams, in nightmares, and if finding myself afterwards on earth I were able to retain the memory of what I had done on the other planet, and at the same time knew that I should never, under any circumstances, return there, then looking from the earth to the moon, should I care or not? Should I feel shame for that action or not? These were idle and superfluous questions, for the revolver was already lying before me, and I knew in every fiber of my being that it would happen for certain. But they excited me, and I raged. I could not die now without having first settled something. In short, the child had saved me, for I put off my pistol shot for the sake of these questions. Meanwhile, the clamor had begun to subside in the captain's room. They had finished their game and were settling down to sleep, and meanwhile were grumbling and languidly winding up their quarrels. At that point, I suddenly fell asleep in my chair at the table, a thing which has never happened to me before. I dropped asleep, quite unawares. Dreams, as we all know, are very queer things. Some parts are presented with appalling vividness, with details worked up with the elaborate finish of jewelry, while others one gallops through, as it were, without noticing them at all, as, for instance, through space and time. Dreams seem to be spurred on not by reason, but by desire, not by the head, but by the heart. And yet what complicated tricks my reason has played, sometimes in dreams, what utterly incomprehensible things happen to it. My brother died five years ago, for instance. I sometimes dream of him. He takes part in my affairs. We are very much interested, and yet all through my dream I quite know and remember that my brother is dead and buried. How is it that I am not surprised that, though he is dead, he is here beside me and working with me? Why is it that my dream fully accepts it? But enough. I will begin about my dream. Yes, I dreamed a dream, my dream of the 3rd of November. They tease me now, telling me it was only a dream. But does it matter whether it was a dream or reality, if the dream made known to me the truth? If once one has recognized the truth and seen it, you know that it is the truth, and that there is no other, and there cannot be, whether you are asleep or awake. Let it be a dream, so be it. But that real life of which you make so much, I had meant to extinguish by suicide, and my dream, my dream, oh, it revealed to me a different life, renewed, grand, and full of power. Listen. End of part one of the dream of a ridiculous man.